Hi, today we're going to start a new set of lectures, a module entitled Boundary Layer Theory. And in this module, we are going to attempt to solve the momentum equation and the continuity equation using some simplified assumptions known as the boundary layer assumptions. So, uh, the objective of this module is to develop the boundary layer assumptions in order to estimate the velocity profile. From that, we can estimate the pressure profile, and then ultimately, we're interested in the resulting viscous drag. All right, so the outline for the activities within the module are to define the nomenclature and um, the assumptions for the boundary layer. We'll do that by rescaling the momentum and continuity equations uh, specifically for the boundary layer, and then pulling out some information that we can use to derive the boundary layer assumptions. And then we'll progress, we'll use those assumptions to, to simplify the Navier-Stokes equations and progress towards the Blasius formulation. We're going to solve the Blasius formulation. We'll compare it with uh, some of the other formulations, such as just uh, the simplified linear velocity profile and uh, the Prandtl 1 7th profile, and we'll do some examples and then we'll uh, look at some turbulent flows. So anyway, buckle up and get ready for a lot of fun. This module, we're just going to introduce boundary layer theory, introduce what the boundary layer is, and the differences between internal and external flow. So there's some basic assumed skills that you're coming in this uh, module with. Uh, the Reynolds transport theorem is always important. We're building on the integral methods that we introduced earlier. Uh, some comfort with the Navier-Stokes equations and manipulating them. And so that really means some comfort with vector calculus, uh, ordinary differential equations. And the more you know about partial differential equations, the better. We're also going to be uh, mucking about with some numeric solutions. And I'm going to work with uh, MATLAB, Maple, Fortran, and maybe some C here moving forward. So some comfort with that is essential. All right, I thought I'd get started with some references, uh, other books that you can look at. Of course, you know I love Bert Stewart and Lightfoot. That's a classic. Um, there's another book by G.K. Batchelor. I have a copy of that somewhere, but this is a really great book. There's Batchelor there. And it's not my favorite fluids book, but I included it because um, it is really a, a well-written book. But you know, if my house were to catch on fire, I wouldn't run back in there to get G.K. Batchelor's book. Uh, Schlichting, now this is a great book. Uh, this is Schlichting's book here, and it continues to be in print, although he died uh, quite, a, quite a long time ago. And it's a classic, and if you see this in a used bookstore, definitely buy it. Landau and Lipschitz. Now, this is a crazy good book. Uh, I have a copy of it here, a used copy. These guys were Russians and uh, just super geniuses. Uh, they wrote a whole series of books in physics, basically. Um, I don't know how many they are, maybe six or seven books, and they are all fantastic books. You've got to get a hold of those if you can. Now, we're going to move on to a, to a different series of books, this uh, Kundu, Cohen, and Dowling. The difference between these top four books and these other books is that these guys developed the theories and the ideas that we're talking about. So it's kind of fun to read their books, whereas the ones that are going to be listed below here really are amalgamations of, of knowledge. And they're good in their own right because it's good to put it all together, but uh, there's definitely a different class in the way they're written. Uh, uh, you know this book, uh, Kundu, Cohen, and Dowling. Whoa, that's a classic book, uh, or becoming a classic book in fluid mechanics. But it's a, it's a modern day book. It's an amalgamation of, of work. Frank White has two books, The Viscous Flow and uh, The Undergraduate Mechanical of Fluid Mechanics. These are both really, really nice, readable texts. And he draws heavily from Bachelor and Schlichting. So uh, I really like this Viscous Flow book, his graduate level book. And I think it's in the third or fourth edition now. And um, some of the earlier editions cover stuff that is not in the later editions. Fox McDonald Pritchard, really a nice undergraduate textbook, an introduction to fluid mechanics. I couldn't write intro because I didn't want to 
impinge upon Lev Landau and this awesome haircut this guy's got going. So uh, I abbreviated that. And then uh, there's Simbala and Sengal. Uh, this is a nice book. It's getting better all the time. I didn't like the first edition, but I'm starting to like it more. There's a book by Panton that I really like um, that uh, maybe what I'll do is post this list along with a longer list. Like here's a book by Sherman that isn't on this list. This is Viscous Flow. And let me give you a tip. You see these, see these bindings? These are the McGraw-Hill bindings. They uh, bind them in this special way, especially like this, when they're real classic books. So when they get this particular binding, uh, if you see this in a bookstore, used bookstore, just buy the thing, right? All right, let's move on. Let's talk about boundary layer. So we talked about irrotational flow, and um, you've got a good feeling for what irrotational flow is. We're going to talk about viscous flow now. So the irrotational flow was outside of this boundary layer, this viscid core, right? And this viscid core is really developed through the result of the no-slip boundary condition and viscosity. So the fact that the fluid has to come to rest on the surface and that it is moving at some velocity far away from the surface creates the situation where the fluid flow has to slow down and eventually come to zero on the surface. It creates the velocity profile. All right, this profile grows and changes, and the, d the demarcation between the um, inviscid region above the profile and the viscid region below the profile is called the boundary layer. So this dotted line here on this plot is the boundary layer itself, and it's, and it's separating the viscid and inviscid, or the inner and the outer regions. Now, if there is no no-slip boundary condition, then the fluid is free to slip along the surface, as is shown here. This velocity vector is uh, large right on the surface, and this is an inviscid or an irrotational flow field. So we're going to work here specifically on just the viscous core. Now, you can see this, that we're setting up a situation where we have an inner and an outer flow, and there was an idea that people would match these two, asymptotic match. Uh, and that was developing through the 60s and the 70s and even into the 80s, but the prevalence of CFD and computer simulations have really kind of squelched that idea, but it still, it still persists, this inner and outer flow and asymptotic matching, and maybe we'll talk a bit about that if we have some time. All right, why do we care about the boundary layer? Why do we care that it, that it, that it goes to zero? The reason that we care is because the friction and the shear stress are all defined by the shape of the velocity profile, right? If you have a flat plate here, and I submerge this flat plate into a wind tunnel with a free stream velocity, what's going to happen? Well, we've got a no-slip condition, so the velocity has to come to zero at the plate. When it does that, it kind of slows the fluid down above it. It retards the flow of the fluid above it and in so doing creates this velocity profile. And so I've drawn it here, and notice I've drawn the vectors so that they're slightly pitched up away from the plate, so they don't have to be parallel necessarily. And they could have u, v, and w components of velocity. They could have x, y, and z components of velocity, respectively. And those components could change with respect to x, y, and z, and time. Right? So it could be a very complicated flow field. And at station x1, you could have one velocity profile. And uh, somewhere down the plate, you could have a second velocity profile. Now, the gradient of this velocity is indicative of the shear stress. So here's the gradient right here, partial u, partial y. The derivative of the x direction of the velocity with respect to y, the x component of velocity with respect to y. So that's the slope, and I'm showing you the slope here, and specifically, this is the slope at the plate. Of course, there are many slopes along the velocity profile, right? There's a slope there, so there's a shear stress there as well. At, and by there, I mean at this location tangent to where we're taking the slope. So this is the tangent location, and I'm just extending that slope out so you can see it, right? Somewhere down the plate, as I mentioned before, some x, x2, the boundary layer or the velocity profile could be different, very different, in fact. We don't know uh, what the shape of the velocity profile will be. Uh, under really ideal conditions, 
we would hope that the velocity profile would be self-similar, meaning that I could stretch and squish this velocity profile to be on top of that velocity profile, but it's not necessarily the case. Um, so we'll keep our eye out for self-similar velocity profiles. And then I can draw the boundary layer itself. So the boundary layer is the location, it's defined as the location where the velocity reaches 99% of the free stream velocity, the free stream velocity here. So as we move from zero, the no slip condition up, the velocity increases as we move up. And then at some point, we almost reach the free stream velocity or 99% of the free stream velocity. We say, okay, that's the boundary layer right there. That's the demarcation between the viscid influence and the inviscid influence. And this layer grows, as you can see with this red line, uh, as the profile moves down the plate or as the flow moves down the plate. So the, we typically denote the boundary layer height with this delta function, and it's typically a function of x. All right, and you know, boundary layers exist in a lot of places, not just fluid mechanics, they also exist in heat transfer. So here's Fourier's law, which is the conduction coefficient times the gradient of temperature, and this is the 3D gradient, but if you think of just the 1D gradient, that again is some gradient, uh, delta T by delta X, and so uh, there are boundary layers within uh, fluid flow, or, uh, within heat transfer, you could have a hot fluid, and there's a gradient of temperature here, and then it maybe conducts through a, uh, a solid surface, and then there's a gradient through that solid surface, and then again, maybe it convex or advex or convex uh, um, through a second fluid. So uh, again, there could be a gradient. So. All of these gradients exist everywhere, and you can think of this maybe as a boundary layer right in here, and maybe there's another boundary layer right in here. So uh, we care a lot about boundary layers because in the case of heat transfer, that tells us what the heat transfer or what the flux is, right? This is <clears throat> the flux of heat, and it's directly related to the gradient of the temperature within the velocity, uh, within the, within the, the, uh, the profile. So evaluated at the wall if we're interested in if we're interested in the flux at the wall. And I, I do want to make that point that uh, you know the shear stress does not have to be evaluated at the wall. The shear stress could be evaluated anywhere within this within this gradient. So if you're a little particle floating along and you're subjected to this a velocity gradient, you could be sheared in half or, or distorted by the fact that you're traveling through uh, a shear profile that's described by this equation here for Newtonian fluid. All right. So uh, we talked about the boundary layer on a flat plate. Here's a boundary layer uh, growing on a curved surface like an airfoil, and it's quite complicated, as you know. There's a Here's some streamlines that I've drawn, and here's the stagnation point, and LBL means laminar boundary layer, and so the boundary layer attaches to the, to the airfoil, and it begins to grow, and then maybe it transitions in a transition region, and then it becomes quite large, uh, and that's a result of the turbulent boundary layer, so there's again a boundary layer in here where the velocity goes up, and then maybe it kind of matches with the free stream. And then it can separate, right? So it can begin to uh, get really strange looking here, and then eventually it can be uh, a shape that looks like that, where it's really zero or close to zero for a long time near separation. And then post-separation, the boundary layer actually flows backwards, and then uh, and then becomes uh, flows downstream above the separated region. So in this region, this viscous wake region, it can be quite swirly and 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 uh, quite complicated. So the things that we talk about with regard to the boundary layer don't really hold everywhere along this airfoil. Maybe they're only valid in this laminar boundary layer region. Um, and as I, s I mentioned earlier, we'll eventually talk about uh, aspects of the turbulent flow. All right, so these things that we're going to talk about are true for internal flow. So the internal flow, like the flow in a pipe here, where you've got a boundary layer that's developing, 
Here's the dotted line here denotes the boundary layer, the developing boundary layer, and eventually within an internal flow, the boundary layer from the top and the bottom begin to communicate, so to speak, or they realize that, they're, that there's another surface up there and you get this fully developed boundary layer that doesn't uh, change uh, with respect to uh, the position down the pipe once it's fully developed. And of course, uh, if we're talking about a turbulent flow, we're talking about on average it doesn't change. In a laminar flow, uh, then uh, we're talking about the, uh, the actual profile shape itself that we can visualize. And so uh, we know the transition occurs for a pipe around 2200, and then for external flow, the boundary layer is free to grow forever uh, away from the plate, and it continues to grow. And with this particular plot, we're showing uh, a laminar boundary layer growing, and then maybe it transitions naturally to a turbulent boundary layer, and then it gets quite large quite quickly, um, and then uh, the inviscid region is outside the boundary layer. We typically think that this boundary layer height, this delta, is much, much smaller than, say, some characteristic length, length of the plate. The transition from laminar to turbulent on a flat plate occurs not at 2200, but it's something much larger, at the, about a half a million. And this is the Reynolds number with respect to x as the characteristic length, the position down the plate. So it's kind of odd because as you move down the plate, the Reynolds number continuously changes. So one then imagines that if the critical Reynolds number is half a million, then for any plate, for any flow, if you go far enough down the plate as x increases, eventually it must transition. And that's different than an internal flow such as a pipe where it's defined just as D. So in fact, we could have, theoretically, a pipe that's infinitely long, and it could remain laminar forever. All right, um, here's a flat plate with a little more detail showing this uh, laminar turbulent boundary layer and the transition region. So you can see there's a laminar region, and it's a little more accurate, you know, this profile here is drawn with uh, the vectors all being parallel, and we often use that as an assumption, parallel flow. But in fact, the vectors within the laminar boundary layer are not parallel to the plate. There, there has to be some, some upward motion of, of, the, uh, of the, the fluid because the fluid is, is always at rest at the plate, and so it has to, in order to conserve mass, flow upward just a bit uh, in order to, uh, to accommodate the, the uh, continuously decreasing flow. And then that, in fact, then uh, is what causes the boundary layer to grow, the fact that this fluid must uh, push upward away from the plate. And in fact, if you have a, a boundary layer, and I like to use the example of a belt sander as a flat plate that's moving along, you can actually feel, if you get really close to it, you can feel some velocity component coming off the belt sander. Uh, and so it's not just dragging the flow along the belt sander, it actually is also inducing a flow normal to it. Now in the transition region, it begins to swirl a bit, it begins to become a little more chaotic, and then eventually within the laminar, uh, sorry, within the turbulent boundary layer, it's completely swirling and it's a total mess. And this could be happening even though the external flow is completely laminar. So that's pretty fascinating that you can have this turbulent boundary layer and, it, and a laminar external flow. So turbulent flows are characterized by this swirling. In fact, they swirl quite a bit in there. Uh, you wouldn't know which way is up or down. So the components of the velocity in the u, v, and w direction are all about the same within the turbulent boundary layer, this isotropic turbulent assumption that's quite fascinating. There's also this characteristic that if you think about it, the fact that the, the velocity has to be zero at the plate means that if we, as we move down towards the plate, the velocity, the, the mean velocity must decrease, 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 and at some point it becomes relaminarized, right? There's a laminar region. And so uh, over the years, there have been these regions named the turbulent boundary layer, sure, there it is. Then there's this overlap region. There's the buffer region, and there's the viscous sublayer, which is really a laminar region. And we'll talk more about that later, but uh, here we're going to focus just on laminar flow.
it's ordered, its vectors are nearly parallel. The laminar boundary layer transitions, as we said, at around half a million with regard to a Reynolds number calculated using the position along the plate. Uh, drag on the plate then can be calculated using the, if this is a Newtonian fluid, the Newtonian definition of drag, and this is the incompressible one, right? So this is just partial U, partial Y, partial V, partial X, and this is just the component uh, XY. So this would tell us the viscous drag on the plate. The turbulent boundary layer, uh, they're disordered and they swirl, as I mentioned. Uh, they're always 3D, so the velocity components can never be simple, simplified much beyond uh, this here. And they're time varying, which is complicated. Uh, we replace the 3D time varying profile with an average profile. So the profile that you're seeing here is an average, is a, is a temporally uh, averaged profile. And I'll show you a video of that in a second. And then the drag on the flat plate is also uh, calculated in the same way using this uh, same velocity, uh, using the same uh, Newtonian stress definition. Within the turbulent boundary layer, as I mentioned, there can be this relaminarization, and it's quite a complicated profile if we were to show you what it looked like. Uh, zoom in here, and we'll touch on that uh, some, uh, a few lectures from now. All right, I think you've seen this video before, but uh, you can't see it too many times, so I'll go ahead and show it to you again. The boundary layer on the bottom side is laminar and two-dimensional. On the top side, the boundary layer has been tripped by a wire placed well upstream. The unsteady motions in the turbulent boundary layer are three-dimensional. Some of the motions are perpendicular to the plane of view. These timelines correspond closely to the instantaneous velocity profiles for the two types of boundary layers. So here they're showing different snapshots in time, and they're going to superimpose them. Superimposing a number of displacement lines enables us to obtain a mean velocity profile for the turbulent layer and the laminar layer, and at the same time gives an experimental notion as to where the fluctuations occur and how large they are in the plane of mean motion. In this photograph, we can compare mean laminar and turbulent profiles. Here is the laminar one, the turbulent one, and here they are superimposed. The velocity gradient normal to the plate is larger for the turbulent layer, and it therefore has a larger wall shear stress or drag. So you can see, or maybe you can just barely see the slopes here that are drawn. And, uh, you know, don't be deceived about this slope. It looks like if I asked you which slope is steeper, you might be tempted to say the laminar one. But remember, it's because the axes are flipped here. Uh, this is the velocity direction V, and this, is, and this is Y here. And so when we take the gradient, we take, we take that gradient. So you have to think of it as, this, as if this were flipped around. So in fact, really, the thing would look like uh, that. And then the turbulent would be much sharper than the laminar. All right, anyway, so let's wrap this up. Uh, we're going to do this introduction to boundary layers. And next time, we're going to non-dimensionalize the Navier-Stokes equations appropriately for boundary layer theory. All right, see you next time.